Hello everyone, my name is Nicola. I'm a product manager at Waymo, and I'm here today to talk about road mapping and very particularly about growth stage product road mapping. We have a very big agenda, so we're gonna dive in very quickly. The idea is to talk first about what is a roadmap, then what is a growth stage product, uh, and then combine the two and, and define what a growth roadmap is. Then we're gonna look at some of the key elements of a growth roadmap. We're gonna look about what is a grow lever, uh, what, is, what does it mean to prioritize when it comes to growth, how you experiment, a different type of growth, some key examples, and then risks and takeaways. Uh, very simple start. What is a roadmap? You can think of it, and I think everybody's aware of it. It's just a document outlining what you're going to do, how much is it going to cost you, when you're going to get done, and what you're going to get out of it. You use spreadsheet, you use Jira, you use any type of project management, in the very essence, it's just a list uh, that is in a specific order and it says, this is what we're doing. Now, a little bit more finicky is the definition of growth stage product. Uh, a negative way of defining it is to say that a growth stage product is a product that is not zero to one uh, and is not declining neither. But in a more positive way, what you would say is that a product that has validated its use case with probably early adopters and it's ready to mass adoption, it's a product that is entering growth stage. So any product where the retention curve has flattened, right? So you have found a core use case, you've found a core set of users that are interested in your product and are sticking with it, is a product that is entering growth stage. And what it means is that you're probably going to see an increase in process innovation and a decrease in product innovation. Why is that? Because you want to push for optimizations versus innovation because optimization is safer, has less risk, and it's more likely to give you outcomes. And since you have already achieved market fit, you don't want to jeopardize that by taking swings and like attempting new things. You want to make sure that you extract the value that you've built at the maximum possibilities. And so when you think about growth roadmap, it's really about putting together these two things. What are the projects that are going to help me maximize my return of investment by quantifying cost, outcomes, and risk in a very clear way? How can I make sure that I'm going to take the projects that are more likely to give me this? And so it means more likely to have a clearly contained cost, a clear contained outcome, and very clear contained risk. Why? Because you don't want to jeopardize your market fit. You want to extract from your position. And so we're going to dive more, but this is a key difference with zero to one. Zero to one roadmaps are, don't have clearly quantifiable cost outcomes and risk. Why? Because you don't know how long is it going to take to build what you want to take. You don't know what is it going to get out of it. And you don't know what problems you might encounter down the line. And so that's a very clear difference. Once you've built something, now you know what it takes to build it. You know what it takes to improve it as well. And so growth is about smoothing the edges, it's clearly in the pipes. Everything is much more clear. It means also everything needs to be done in a more precise way. And it's, it's about volumes uh, because you want to have a lot of small incremental changes. But we'll see a little bit more. Let's dive into key elements now. North Star metric. Growth is about measurement, and so it's about North Star metric. Every product has metrics. Zero to one products have metrics. They have sometimes North Star metrics. Most of the times, they have multiple metrics. And the very big difference between zero to one and growth is that growth stage products are always able to roll up any granularity of metrics up to a North Star. That is not always true for zero to one because in zero to one, you still don't know how you're delivering value. And so you don't know which of the two, three, one, five metrics you've picked as like very high level is the one that you need to trade off on, is the one that you want to move the most. And generally, zero to one product to have, you know, one to three metrics at times because uh, you just have to figure out which one is the right one, which one is the measuring the real success of the product. Some examples, some material if you want to dive deeper, but I think uh, this is fairly clear. Uh, the next step is a user funnel. Again, something that like you have as well in zero to one is just breaking down the user journey through your product. Uh, the reason why you do that is because you want to identify like each product feature and how it relates to uh, your metric. 
And some very high level concept when you think about uh, user funnel, it always goes between like canonically can be interpreted as like going from awareness to interest to evaluation to conversion, right? Uh, we'll take different products. We'll see how this relates. But it's a very high level. That's the idea, right? Uh, when you put this, uh, this is an example. I forgot about this slide. <laughs> this is an example of what a user funnel look like. Awareness, this is content creation for so awareness is I have an entry point here on the bottom right. You don't see very well, but there is like a blue. Uh, this is Twitter, formerly known as Twitter. Um, and so you have on the bottom right, you have a plus that says like enter creation funnel. So I'm aware that that exists. Then I go to the next step. There's an interest aspect. I clicked on it. I want to see what it is about. And there's an evaluation aspect. I added a picture, so I'm going to make a post. And then finally, there is the conversion aspect. I'm going to post, right? So different type of steps for different uh, uh, levels of this product funnel, right? Now, when you put these two things together, you get into a growth model. So you think about all of this product funnel, you can break them down into specific metrics. Number of creators is the top North Star metric when you're thinking about being in charge of content creation. Then that number is a function of different metrics. And each of specific this metric can, break down, can be broken down into more granular metric. And more granular metric relates to specific part of the products. So existing creators times posting rate is plus new users and activation rate, that's your creator's number. Now, posting rate is a function of like user entering the creation funnel and the completion rate, so going through it. Now, the number of users entering the creation funnel is a function of like how many users are at the top of the creation funnel and their CTR. And so down the line, you can break all of this. And so you can start thinking about like how you go from this North Star metric down very granularly to a very tiny metric that is specific to a very specific part of the product. We'll see why you'd want to do that. But the bottom line is moving North Star metrics is extremely challenging and you don't want to start a project thinking you're going to move that directly because you might not be able to measure it. And the reason for that is that you might not have the time or the experimentation uh, power to just go make a product and make an impact and measuring it in a short term. And so that's why you relate, you rely on smaller metrics that are more sensitive to your change and that you know can be rolled up to your key North Star eventually. We'll see more what it means. So now you have like a North Star, you have a user funnel, you have a growth model, Let's talk about how you move the needle, how you come up with projects, right? So this is a good time to introduce growth levers. Growth levers are like some principles. Here are line five. You can Google, you'll find different, but this is the find that I found uh, be very uh, consistent into the product that I work with. The idea is like you want to create, uh, how do you move the needle? How do you grow that product funnel, right? Like, these are some principles that you apply to each of those steps of the user funnel to move the metrics in the direction you want. First step, you can increase discoverability, right? So for every of those steps that we talk about, you increase the discoverability to go to the next one. You make it more visible for users to uh, increase the awareness. Then you have reducing friction. You want to make that simpler, less clicks. And so you move the user down the funnel. Then you have increasing friction. So you increase how hard it is to actually go back into the funnel. Now, this can be seen as like a little bit antagonistic at the beginning because the idea is like, oh, you're going to trap the user. It can be done that way and it is done that way, but there is actually a healthy way of doing this as well. And there's mimicry, which is basically the idea of like, I want to help my users just to do what they other users are doing, right? Like, so you see something and you just want to replicate that. Um, so that is to a little bit simplify the um, process for the users and just like have him do something that someone else already did, did and they've seen it and they're like, yeah, that works for me. I want to do the same. Uh, and then the last aspect is the reward, right? So increasing the reward of like completing this funnel, of going through the process. And why you want to do that? Because if you increase the reward, they're more likely to do it again, right? Like users are more interested. Like they went through it and there was like, this looks good. I like it. I want to do it again. Uh, now we'll see some example, but let's dive into prioritization. So 
The main key difference here in prioritization is that growth prioritization is a continuous functions and it leverages some of the variables uh, that are available only in growth stage, such as like this clearly quantifiable risk and returns, right? And this is the big difference with zero to one, where you generally have a prioritization that looks very much as like P0, P1, P2, right? And that's a very step function. It's like P0, all of these projects, P1, all of these projects, and so on, right? But growth is more continuous. You don't really want to fall back to P0s. You want to go more into like, this is a specific outcome. This is my ROI. And here is the continuous function of all of the projects, all of the ROIs. Uh, we look a little bit at an example, but let's take uh, a little bit of a closer look. ROI is your expected movement of your North Star metric or whatever metric you use to pick. It has to be consistent across different projects, but uh, it's basically like your end goal, right? It's good to have like a lower and upper bound. It's good to have them so that you can kind of feel where is it going to move. Then you have like confidence. Confidence is basically how likely the projects that you're talking about is going to deliver what you predict uh, is going to do. And you can set up like cross team agreements of what confidence being. It is often a function of like having experience. Uh, but a good way of saying it is like you can take a percentage and be like, well, I'm going to say 20% confidence if this has never been tried uh, and 90% confidence if this has been done already on a different side of the, pro the product company and we've proven results. For example, this worked on Android. It's going to work on iOS very likely. Not always, but, you know, confidence is higher. And you have cost. Um, cost is just like your constraint function, right? Like what is the number of weeks available from the engineers or like your marketing budget and so on, right? And these, two, uh, these three elements gives you a priority score. Here's a practical example. Let's talk about like, I think that there's a lot of users that are misclicking and exiting my creation funnel. So I'm going to create like a confirmation that says like, are you sure you want to get out? Apologize for this bad design of mine. And here you have like uh, a real example from Instagram. So the idea here is increasing friction in exiting uh, the steps, the, the creation funnel by mistakes. Now, how do I build my ROI? My ROI is going to be the number of users that enters a flow and then exit it. And I am assuming that some of them will be exiting by mistake. You can try to approximate how much, or how many of those. You can use like different type of experience that you have where you've noticed that there was a mistake uh, percentage. But let's assume that I come up and it says like, I think 7,000 of the users that enter every day actually are exiting by mistake. And then they're discouraged and they don't want to get back in and redo it. So they're like, ah, they give up. I am 50% confidence. This has never has been done in some shape or form in a different type of the company, but not in this exact context. The implementation was different, so 50-50. And it's going to be very quick. It's going to take half of a week for me. And so here it is. My return of investment here is 7,000 per week. Now, why do you want to do this, right? Because you want to have a long list of these type of projects, and you want to look at them and being able to compare them. So imagine that you have like a long list of this. You want to have a very, very, very thick list of projects and growth. And then you start looking at the end score priority and you immediately notice how some things don't end up being as high in priority as you might expect. For example, let's say that you have like, oh, I'm going to make an AI generated post machine, right? It's going to have a massive ROI, like 2000 users every day is going to use it. Uh, but I'm not really confident. I don't know if this is going to work, if I'm able to build the solutions. It's going to have a high cost, six weeks, right? And then you compare it with like, I'm going to add this tiny dialogue or I'm going to increase the visibility of the CTA. And then you look at the expected impact and the confidence and the cost. You make those ratios and you immediately realize this is much more worth it. Like it's less ambitious in many ways. It's less innovative in many ways, but it's going to just work. Uh, and that's what you want to go when you're talking about growth. You want to make things that are higher return, lower risk. You're more risk adverse in growth stage. So let's talk about the next step, experimentations in growth. When you have uh, projects, then you want to start thinking about like uh, testing them. Typically, be testing generally lasts like one to four weeks. And once the decision is reached, it's generally ideal to keep a small hold that and we'll see why. And the process, I think, is very similar. A-B testing, review, launch, iterate. Not all the times that can happen zero to one. 
at times in zero to one, you don't have enough volume to do a fair A-B testing. At times you also don't have like the possibility of not launching. Like it's not a choice. Like you invested too much, this is going to get launched and you don't have enough data to say like, I don't, I shouldn't. And so when in doubt, you just have to push through. When you're in growth stage, because the product are so in between quotes cheap and you have so many, not launching is actually uh, an outcome and an acceptable outcome if you think that's not working. And now the reason why you might not want to launch is because there's different type of growth. And so some products you'll notice give you growth that you don't actually want. Uh, now, a disclaimer, these are absolutely come up na- made up names. There's no such thing as a universally understood as cumulative growth or state, state growth or regress. These are just like things that I made up right now to share the concept. The idea behind here is that growth can be cumulative, so it can continue to increase over time, right? The feature that you do keep conti- like increases the value that it is delivering to the user with times, right? And we'll see an example. It could be a state change. So it's just building the product from one level to another. It's a step function. But once it brings all of the usage to that level, it just stabilizes. Like it's not going to continue to grow in- indefinitely. And then the last one, you have regressing growth, which is your change has initially drove a lot of value, but then it's actually all that value has disappeared. And it's mostly a function of novelty or some unexpected results that you don't want, that you haven't understood from in the network. And we'll see some examples. Uh, so let's go into very practical examples, right? First, a uh, very famous one, people you might know from Facebook, idea being you come on Facebook and you want to retain the user, you want to have them come back and the Facebook team realized that like friendship was a very good uh, indicator. If you have a number of friends, like I think it was 16 or 14 in the first 48 hours or something, you'll come back. And so the idea was like, let's increase the awareness, the availability, the, uh, the ability for users to actually make friends. Let's put that at the very top of the main page. And the interesting thing is, is that this is a long-term impact, right? Like it's cumulative in the sense of, once you remove this feature from the top of the of the main line, your friends continue to be there. So you continue to actually deliver, like you continue to uh, extract value from having make that friendship, from having used it, used this type of feature. So it's the best type of growth you can hope for. It's something that you do, and it's a change into a, on the on the operating mode of the user. Uh, in this case, the metric was friendship, and probably had some guardrails, uh, but you know, that's a very successful example of growth. Now, another example here is autocomplete, right? So here you're trying to reduce friction. You're trying to make things simpler. And the idea is I want to make it so that users don't have to spend too much time into um, typing and I want to help them. And so you reduce the friction of the search experience or you reduce the friction of like replying to messages or replying to requests and, and so on. Now, this is not a self-sustained product growth uh, feature. Once you remove it, user will not retain the the value of having used. The next time I make a search, I I, I don't have the past searches there. Next time I have to reply to a message, if you remove that, I'm I'm not going to retain anything, right? So your numbers, when it comes to like number of searches or like number of replies, will go down as soon as you remove those features. While in this case, if you remove this, your DAU will not go down because those users are retained at this point. They have the friendship, it's there. So in this case, it's a little less self-sustaining, right? Uh, Another example here is uh, the discoverability aspect and the friction aspect. So there is a Facebook feature where if you swipe right and left, you, you see like this music thingy popping up. And the idea is like, let's make it simpler for users to discover music and to enter the music creation flow. Uh, and a similar use case is, is on the right, is a in-between stories card that says, like, create a new story, right? So you're trying to increase awareness, like making people aware that these things happen. And you're trying to make it simpler for them to enter it. And the idea is, like, it's less click away from, from you to, to go through this flow. Now, this is, again, not self-sustained in terms of uh, tomorrow you remove this and nothing, like, your number of creators will, will go down. Um, but it has some network effect, more stories, more content, more engagement, and so on. 
Uh, another example here is the mimicry aspect, right? So the idea is like users see something they like and they want to be able to do the same. On Instagram, you have like the use this audio thingy. When you're consuming a story with like a specific song, you can like, you know, use the audio and build immediately something with it. Or you have like on WhatsApp, something that I found interesting was when you're talking with a business on WhatsApp, you have like an ability to check that they're a business. And once you're on their profile, you can get your, get your own business account. So the idea being like, oh, I'm a business, I'm engaging with this business. And I'm like, oh, I also want to have this. How do I get it? Here it is. This is like, you notice it, you see it, you want to replicate. And so again, this is non-self-sustained for the audio aspect, but it is self-sustained for, for the WhatsApp aspect. Because once the business is converted, it's converted. So that's a shift in the operating point of the user. Like it's changed something at the very core of that uh, entity. So we're talking about some of these examples. And now, now let's look about the risk behind. Uh, there are two main risks behind growth. And, and the first one is short-term prioritization. Because you're, uh, what we discussed right here, of the way that you construct priorities, you will lean towards short and safe uh, projects. And so you will eventually end up in a situation where you have short-term prioritized everything. Because anything just falls below the list when it has a little bit more daring, it's, I don't know, tech depth, related, it is quality related, it just doesn't make the cut. So it's very easy to reach a local maximum uh, where you kind of painted yourself in the corner of the room and now you don't know how to get out of it. And it's, it can be quite uh, painful. Another example of short-term prioritization and, and is the reason why we spoke about um, holdouts is that sometimes growth, and this is the type of growth that you don't want, can be regressing, right? So in the short term, you see this impact. And, and then on the long term, this actually sets you back. An example is reshares, right? Like reshares can like send up the number of creators. You made it much simpler to create. But then what you end up having is a situation where your network is much easier to spread fake news and the quality of your content just decreases because everybody's resharing the same things, right? So you don't have new content coming in and that decreases the value and then long-term impact can be negative. So you short-term prioritize for immediate gains. You didn't look at what was going to come ahead. The second big risk is being leapfrogged. You don't take big swings on the growth team. You don't take daring uh, features. And so you might be left behind. To get out of tech, a good example is Kodak focusing like, on improving their chemical imaging. And then someone else was working on digital cameras. And then they got leapfrogged. Another one is Facebook with like stories. They were working on improving like posting on the timeline and someone made stories and you got leapfrog. And they included stories and then someone made reels and like the TikTok thing. So they had to copy those as well. And so it's very easy to see like you're established, you don't take big chances. And so then you need to learn how to incorporate what's being done in the market and kind of grow it yourself again. Now, this is kind of what we have is very high level, I think it's a good starting point. Let's recap very quickly. You know, roadmap, growth roadmapping is about maximizing your return of investment by focusing on projects that have a clear, quantifiable cost, outcomes, and risk. The main ingredients for this are generally a North Star metric, a user funnel, and a growth model. And once you have those, you can leverage the five common growth levers that I mentioned to identify projects out of any specific user funnel to move the metrics through your growth model and eventually impact the North Star metric. The way you prioritize all of this project is through continuous functions that take into consideration cost, return, and risks in a way that you cannot do uh, on zero to one. And then while you do this exercise, the biggest risk is always to reach a local maximum and being leapfrogged by other products. And so that's what I meant when I said not all products, not products are not all in zero to one or all in growth. You need to have a balance. Some teams work on growth, some teams work on zero to one for every product. And that is the way that you prior, you balance short-term prioritization through growth and long-term um, sustainability through zero to one teams. And so when you are unbalanced into that split, then you start getting into problems. And, and, you know, there is no formula, there is no silver bullet, it's just a try and error, and you need to find 
what is the right time to push on one or to push on another. I hope this was useful. Uh, useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and comment. And it was great to talk to you.